Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today we're getting enthusiastic about phatics, the parts of conversation that we use for their social meaning rather than their literal meaning. But first, exciting book news! <laughs> Uh, the paperback version of my book about internet language, Because Internet, is out in the world very, very shortly, or possibly after, if you're listening to this more than a few days after it came out. If you've been thinking about buying Because Internet and you're like, I just need it to be cuter, the paperback version is officially 200% cuter. It is so tiny and cute. Or if you're a person who likes to have the spines of books bend between your pages as you read them, I understand. You can now get that in paperback. Uh, this is a book all about various aspects of language of the internet. We did a whole episode last year when it came out in hardback about various aspects of internet language when it comes to emoji, and we'll be talking a bit more about internet-y things in this episode as well. So if you like the thinking about how we text and how we email and how we use memes and all of these types of things, or if you want to know how other people are doing these things, this is a useful book for you. You can still buy the hardback or listen to the audiobook if for some reason you are not into adorably cute, very bendable paperbacks. <laughs> yes, people have been saying very nice things to me about the audio recording, which I did myself. So if you like hearing my voice on this podcast <laughs> and you would like to hear my voice for like nine hours straight without any Lauren, <laughs> you can also do that with the audiobook. I should record a little um uh, back channel track for people who just want to pretend it's an extended version of the podcast. Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> Like a 10 second loop. Oh, how interesting. So you can just like stick it in wherever mm. you want in the audiobook. Yeah. Ooh. Ah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh huh. This sounds like a brilliant plan. We need to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This month's Patreon bonus episode is about music and language. It's our 41st bonus episode, which means you can get that and 40 other bonus episodes of the show if you've listened to all of the main episodes at patreon.com slash lingthusiasm. So lots more lingthusiastic content out there for you to enjoy. Hey Gretchen. How's it going? Yeah, not bad. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. It's uh, nice weather today. Yeah, it's pretty hot here actually. Oh yeah, right. I forgot it's summer for you. Oh right, yeah, you guys must have your sweaters out by now. Yeah, it's uh it's a bit chilly in the morning. Yeah, well, okay. Uh yeah. Yeah. Alright. Uh I better let you go. Okay, great to see you. Have a nice one. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye. See ya. Bye. You hang up. <laughs> Click noise. <laughs> Insert special effect here. <laughs> I don't think we decided whether we were having an imaginary street side conversation or an imaginary phone conversation, because I feel like the beginning of that was imaginary street side conversation, and the end part of that was like imaginary phone conversation. <laughs> but the best thing about it was that was a conversation where we ostensibly didn't say anything meaningful, but we had a whole conversation. Yeah, and it's a conversation that most people have probably had in some form or another. It's extremely familiar. It's very ritualized. And that's because the language that we use in greetings, in leave-taking, is something that is less about the literal content of what's being said, and it's more about the social meaning of starting a conversation or ending a conversation or just acknowledging each other's presence by talking about the weather. Yeah, acknowledging the kind of world, and it does, it is a bit hard to talk about the weather, uh, over the internet, as we've discovered, because we don't necessarily have the same weather, which is the kind of, you know, version that you have when you're, when you're reading someone on the street. But in many cases, it's less about the specific words that's being said, and more about the sort of social function of, I'm acknowledging that you're here, we're having a sort of ritualized exchange, it's like doing a little social dance. We have a, you know, a couple steps of a waltz, or a macarena, or whatever your dance of choice is. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then we kind of move on with our day. And it doesn't have to be a, a conversation that has a lot of content to it. We still had this sort of acknowledgement of, of each other's presence. And this kind of dance move ritual speaking is known as a type of speech called phatic or phatic expressions. 
yeah, fatigue is one of those great words that I find myself telling people about a lot because it's like everyone's encountered fatigue expressions. You know, there's these things like, how are you? And hello. And like the first thing you learn on like a language class. And yet the word fatigue itself, it's P-H-A-T-I-C. Uh, it, it's less familiar, even though these things are so very familiar. And we're so used to these fatigue interactions that until something kind of jars with them, we don't often notice them. And we can go through our day using many fatic greetings and leave takings, but we don't always notice them until they maybe go off the rails or we're trying to do one set of dance moves and someone else is doing another. Yeah. And especially, you know, sometimes you get a fatic expression that starts changing, you know, the, it goes according to certain fads, I guess, not that, not that kind of fatic, <laughs> fat, fatic. Um, <laughs> It, and so, like, one of these examples is with, uh, what you say in response to thank you. See, I always get in a little bit of trouble because my first reaction is always to be like, eh, no worries. Right. That's the, that's the very Australian <laughs> response, right? <laughs> yeah. In fact, someone was like, well, you say, you're welcome. And it's just like, ah, oh, yeah, I guess that is an answer as well, but it's not my first informal default. Yeah, I feel like your welcome is like the version that shows up in like the English language learning textbook, not so much the version that I actually say on a regular basis. What do you normally reply to a thanks with? I think I would say like no problem. Maybe also no worries sometimes. I think it's spread here, but no problem is, is definitely one of the defaults for me. And this can kind of create some sorts of tension because if, you know, all of these are accomplishing the same sort of thing, they're like the thing that you say in response to thank you. They're all fitting in the same function socially. But because if you're used to one and you hear the other, you might interpret it more literally. And that kind of thing make people start kind of over-examining and questioning the individual words and that, well, what do you mean? No problem. Of course it's not a problem. Or what do you mean? Of course it's not a worry. Or like, well, you are welcome. Are you not welcome? And people can get very caught up in the literal meaning of phatic expressions when something's undergoing a change. Uh, like changing from you're welcome to no problem to no worries or these kinds of things and not and and think that somebody, therefore, in this interaction must be doing something wrong, when it's really just the, like, okay, language changes sometimes, and this is one that's undergoing a particular change, and people are using it phatically. Yeah, I think when everyone is joining in a square dance, you don't really notice that you're all seamlessly participating in the same dance, and then if someone pulls some other moves, it can feel very disconcerting. It's like, oh, now I'm doing the chicken dance in the middle of the square dance. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> there is an interesting example of this that came up for me when I was in the UK. And I think it was specifically I was in Canterbury and I was going into various shops and, you know, like people do, like you say hello when you go into the shop and people were saying to me, y'all right? And I was like, what do you mean? Is something wrong? Because to me, like, are you all right? Is like, are you okay? Like, that's what you say to someone who's like fallen down in the street and you need to yeah. know if you need to call an ambulance or something. Were you just like checking whether you were bleeding from the head or something? <laughs> right. Like, are you going to be able to get up by yourself or do you need some assistance from a <laughs> passersby, right? Um, <laughs> they were, you were getting too sucked into the literal meaning. They were just right. saying, hello, I'm, in, I'm starting this interaction. Exactly. And they were really saying the equivalent of where I would say, how are you? Or how's it going? And once I started going like the second and the third and the fourth shop, I started figuring this out, right? The first one, I was like, what's going on? But then you hear it again, and you're like, it, it must be me. I am the I am the outsider here. <laughs> um, whereas the inverse, I think if you say, what's up to at least some British people, they interpret that as like, what's wrong? The same like, you know, passerby fell down in the street, or you're asking them if they need assistance. Like, what's up? Some people interpret yeah. that way. Whereas to me, it's just like, oh, how's it going? What's up? They all mean the same thing. Yeah. I like when people get very distracted by what the it is and how's it going. <laughs> how's what Which going? Which in Australian English can be completely reduced to how's gone. How's gone. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, to kind of show that it really is ritualized, you don't even need to clearly articulate it. <laughs> I had this fun experiment that I would do in high school <laughs> on my poor unsuspecting classmates. Mm -hmm. I love a good Gretchen proto-linguist story. <laughs> I've now memorialized this story in the pages of Because Internet because I was leading into discussing phatic expressions on the internet and I was like, oh, I need an offline example, so I'll write this down. <laughs> so, so far, no one has contacted me about this, but I don't know if they noticed at the time. Okay. And what I would do is there was this thing that people would do, which is, you know, possibly the case in many high school, I don't know, where like you're walking down the hallways between classes and you see your friends who aren't in the same class as you and you're like, hey, so-and-so, what's up? Or like, hey, what's up? And you just kind of keep going as you, you know, passing each other in the hallway between one class and the next. Mm -hmm. 
And I realized, because I was a budding linguist, that sometimes people would say, what's up? Not much, nothing much. And sometimes people would say, how's it going? Good, how are you? And these were accomplishing the same thing. I didn't know the word phatic expression, but I was like, these are accomplishing the same thing. And so what I did was, if people said, what's up? I would say, good, how are you? And if people said, how's it going? I would say, not much, what's up with you? I do like it when people do this unintentionally because they're both on autopilot for their own dance moves. And I am not surprised that you of all people decided to use this as an opportunity to try that out. Look, it's very typical. I will grant this. (laughs) (laughs) What was the response? What was the early data collection? So the thing is, is like people wouldn't notice. And this is why I think no one from my high school has emailed me and been like, hey, I read this thing in your book and I remember you doing this. Because I just didn't say anything. As long as you kind of do it like without missing a beat and just kind of like as if it's totally normal and natural to say, people don't notice. Because they're both accomplishing the same thing phatically. It's when you catch yourself and you're like, oh, what's up? No, I mean, how's it going with you? Then then when people are like, oh, no, something's broken because they recover the literal meaning. But as long as you just treat it as a dance, it's kind of like, you know, when I was learning how to do swing dancing for a while, uh, and I was when I was learning how to do it, like, the most important thing was just to not stop, you know? Like, if you stopped and were like, oh, no, did I get that step right? Whereas you could just kind of keep going. Yeah. And even if the steps weren't perfect, you could kind of figure it out. This is basically me when it comes to dancing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we should specify that we're not talking about the kind of dancing that you do when you're like alone at home in your pajamas and you're just like, you know, rocking out in front of the computer. We're talking about the kinds of social dances that require you to take into account other people and how they exist and move together with other people in some sort of fashion. As long as you move some limb on every beat of the Macarena, you can pretend to be keeping up. (laughs) I wonder how much you could mess with the Macarena and still have people think of it as a recognizable Macarena. This sounds fun. (laughs) I feel like high school corridor Gretchen would approve of this experiment. (laughs) How badly can I misspell the YMCA dance? I'm just wondering. So other than people kind of misstepping or deliberately misstepping, uh, the other time phatics can break down and people get a bit unable to navigate them is when the literal context breaks the ritualization. So if everyone's going through a bad patch at the same time and you call someone up and you're like, the the default to start that conversation is, how are you? And it's just like, mm-hmm. there's also this like second layer of the dance where you can all be like, yeah, look, fine, I guess. Where the, like the tendency to just want to say, yeah, fine, how are you? Is like at loggerheads with the fact that we all know we're going through a bad phase at the moment. And it's like, <sighs> but I also really appreciate that if you are going through a bad phase, it's still completely fine as part of the ritualized dance to be like, yeah, I'm fine. And you don't actually have to engage with someone if you don't want to. Yeah, exactly. Or there are sorts of non-responses you can give, you know, not too bad or like, oh, well, it's a day and just kind of keep going with that, which means you don't have to give maybe strangers in a cafe or something like (laughs) this great insight into your interiority because you're not actually friends. You can just do the ritual dance and you have done the dance at the ritual level, and it can be okay to stay there with other types of acquaintances. The other time I really notice the ritualized nature of phatic expressions is when I'm learning a new language, Mm. because they're often like day one, chapter one of a textbook. You learn how to say, hello, how are you? Goodbye, have a nice day. And you also just have to use them a lot if you're speaking a language or if you have a good language teacher who makes you use these in every class. So they often are also the things that stay in your brain the longest. Yeah, they have that sort of like ritualized response. You know, it's kind of like one person yawns and so you need to yawn. Like one person says, how are you? And you can't help but reply, good, how are you? Even though if you're not thinking about it too hard. Yeah. But once you learn the steps to the dance in a particular culture or language, um, in Nepal, For example, instead of how are you or talking about the weather, the kind of opening move of the dance is you eaten and you reply with, yeah, I've eaten or ha ha, not yet. (laughs) But I, that's great. (laughs) uh, Until I really got the hang of it being a ritualized dance, I'd I'd take it really literally and be like, oh, well, I, I had breakfast a little while ago, but like, I'm not, I'm not that hungry now. So like, maybe I'll eat later. And people would just be like, what is what is happening? <laughs> Why are you doing this? <laughs> He's like, of course you've eaten at some point in the past, but maybe it was too late. Yeah. yeah. They were just like, I was, 
was just moving the conversation on. <laughs> I am actually calling to ask you about going out this afternoon, and I'd be <laughs> stuck on eating still. It's also kind of funny. I've noticed this, especially doing uh, radio interviews for the book, actually, is because when you're on the radio, they want you to do a mic check. Mm -hmm. And so to do a mic check, they need you to just talk for like 30 seconds about anything. And the standard question that they ask you is what you had for breakfast. And they don't care what you had for breakfast. They don't care if it was healthy. They don't care if you just had coffee. Like, they really don't care what you had for breakfast. They just need you to talk for 30 seconds. But the first couple times I went into a radio station and they asked me what I had for breakfast, and I'd be like, uh, you know, oh, did I have eggs or cereal this morning? And really have to think about it very hard. <laughs> They're just asking you a very functional question and you are taking it way too literally. <laughs> You're like me in Nepal. Exactly, right. So it's, it's this, this is like the have you eaten question in a couple different places that, that people can do this. I also noticed this in Montreal when I moved here because sometimes you learn a phatic expression in a textbook that's not actually the current phatic expression anymore or in a particular area. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Right, exactly. Like if you if you learn you're welcome and then you, you know, show up in an English speaking area and everyone's saying no problem and no worries and you're like, "Oh, no, no one prepared me for this." <laughs> And I remember shortly after I moved to Montreal, and I had learned in my language textbook, like, the way you say my name is, is je m'appelle Gretchen, or whatever. Even as someone who speaks no functional French, I know that is how you say that in French. Yeah, and the literal translation of it is, like, I call myself. Um, it's using using the verb to, to be called, like an appellation. Whereas the vernacular way that people actually say this, at least in Montreal, is generally moi say Gretchen. And this means literally, like, me, it's Gretchen. <laughs> Translating these things literally never works well. Right! Like, the literal translations never work particularly well. And completely different words. Same social function. And I remember I was at, like, a crowded party or something. I think I might have actually been trying to swing dance. <laughs> Excellent. And, you know, so it was a bit of a loud environment, and somebody gestured to themselves and was like, moi say, you know, whatever this person's name was. And I was like, what? I, like what am what am I supposed to say to this? And like what what do you want in response? And it was clearly this ritualized thing. Like, and then if you want to ask someone else's name, you could say like toi, like you, which again is not how I learned to do this in the language learning classroom sense. Oh my gosh, you had to learn new dance steps and new social dance steps at the same time. What a champion! I know it's so poetic. What a metaphor we have going. <laughs> I love cross cultural examples of phatics and ritualized speech, and I'm. Actually, very disappointed in the lack of examples on the Wikipedia page for these. So, if people want to share examples, but even more excitingly, if you want to edit the Wikipedia page so there's more than <laughs> English and then a couple of Japanese and Persian examples, because there is a lot of cross cultural variation. That's so public spirited of you, Lauren. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's always really interesting to hear people's examples, and it's very salient to you when you trip into something that's not the phatic expressions you're used to, and the ones you are used to are so non-salient until something happens. But yeah, it's a really fun area of stories in, in different languages or different cultural circumstances. Another place I really enjoy people playing around with phatic expressions is in fiction, mm. especially because we're both big sci-fi and fantasy readers, and being set in different worlds or different times, it's such a great opportunity to play around with these rituals and create norms that are very different to ours. Yeah, absolutely. One example that I uh, really like is from The Just City, which is a book by Joe Walton, which is set in kind of an ancient Greek-esque fantasy world Ooh. where one of the characters is fictionalized Socrates. And the characters all say to each other when they greet each other, joy to you in English. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, which is this sort of different greeting from, you know, good morning, good night. And it's very clearly has this sort of function of a greeting and a farewell, I think they also say when they're they're leaving. And so I ask Joe because she's a Montrealer and I know her, uh, if this is, you know, a translation of something. And she was like, yeah, this is a translation of a greeting herete, which gets used okay. both in like Homer and Plato and all the way up to modern Greek, um, that people use sometimes translated as rejoice, but also joy to you is a, is a reasonable English translation. Cool. So bringing a set of phatic rituals from one culture and language into the fictionalized world as part of, like, giving it a bit of an authentic flavor. Right. And, like, this explanation isn't in the text anywhere. You don't need to provide this additional context to a reader because they can figure out that the characters are arriving and leaving and, and greeting each other. It just helps emphasize it as a bit of a different world. And especially probably saying something like goodbye, which in etymology is God be with you, might kind of strike you kind of weird in this context where, like, there is Athena and Apollo and not 
you know, a, a god that is the, <laughs> the form of the one that's the etymology of goodbye. So, you know, it, it provides a kind of useful little nugget of world building to have the thetic expressions also be different. It's one of the things I really enjoyed about working with PM Freestone on the language construction for her Shadow Scent duology is that she thought really hard about plausible in-world fatic expressions. And so the leave-taking ritual is Stars Keep You, which is related to the star wheels, which are related to kind of destiny, but also navigation and a few spoilery plot points that I won't mention from those books, but it's just one of the little things that really situates you in a world outside of our own, and I always really appreciate that. Yeah, it's that extra sort of, you know, thing that that indicates something of the book. I mean, there's also the classic sort of may the force be with you Star Wars leave-taking expression. <laughs> Which, like, it always just rubs up against the phatic expression of and also with you from Catholic church excursions in my childhood. Yeah, yeah I definitely <laughs> had enough exposure to this that I'm like, and, and also with you? It's like, oh no, we're mixing up two dances here. <laughs> <laughs> I think that kind of speaks to the power of the phatic expression as a dance that often has a sort of call and response or, you know, first part, second part, or like multi-part thing, where you do have this impetus to respond in a particular way, the same way if someone just lets, how are you, hang, you're like, no, 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 I need to resolve that. I've actually been very pleased in my elaborate multi-year Star Trek television watching deep dive that I've been on to discover the response to Live Long and Prosper oh. is peace and long life. Oh, that's very nice. I know the first part, but not the second part. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you can just reply with the gesture you can reply by repeating, but there is actually a, a call and response option there, which really fits with that fatics as dances where you're both making moves. Yeah, so there's the new world building task of like make a make a two part fatic <laughs> expression. <laughs> it's not just fatics in face to face communication; it's also there are written fatics. And one of my favorite kinds are these sorts of letter writing conventions where you have, you know, these very elaborate greetings and farewells. And, you know, this is not as common in the modern day email. <laughs> um, there's this great example of that in the musical Hamilton, where in the archival records between these two characters, well, real people, I guess, they have exchanged a bunch of letters that culminate in them fighting a duel. But they sign each of these letters that are clearly very angry because it ends in a duel with your obedient servant, even though they're like really annoyed at each other. I feel like that is an even more extreme version of like the saying that you're fine when you're not fine. Right, um. right. <laughs> like clearly you're not an obedient servant. And this irony is so noticeable to the modern reader that there's a song in the musical about them fighting the duel, which has as the chorus the obedient servant part, because the dramatic irony is just too tempting for a modern reader. Although back in the day, like, it was not particularly ironic because this was just a stock phrase. They were just signing off their letters as they were taught. Yeah, that's just what you put. Yeah. It's kind of like saying sincerely. Like, sometimes you can send someone a really nasty letter and still say sincerely, and you're like, ha ha ha. <laughs> like, I hate you, but sincerely. <laughs> yes. Like, I feel like we maybe are more attuned to the dissonance in writing because we, just like with writing as a practice itself, have to learn it very overtly often at school. I still remember having lessons in how to kind of set out a letter. And there is a lot about learning fatics that happens kind of throughout your childhood years, which I find interesting because we tend to think about language learning as this thing that you kind of get out the way by the time you've gone to school, you can speak. But learning the more elaborate dances of these phatic turn-taking expression dances, we kind of do it our whole life as we move through different places where we need to practice them. There's this really brilliant example of this from Winnie the Pooh. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Which I think, you know, children's literature often kind of illustrates this literalness because adults find it very funny. And it goes, And how are you? said Winnie the Pooh. Eeyore shook his head from side to side. Not very how, he said. I don't seem to have felt at all how for a long time. Dear, dear, said Pooh. I'm sorry about that. Let's have a look at you. Oh, <laughs> bless. Poor Eeyore. Bless poor old Eeyore. <laughs> 
poor Eeyore not feeling very well and not realizing that he was just meant to say, fine, how are you? Or even, you know, not so great, but you know, like, like there are ways to say not so how, um, but it's not the how are you, I'm not how at all. <laughs> or, you know, how how are you, how do I what? Which was one of my favorites as a kid. That's a good one. In Nepali, one of the informal ways, instead of saying, have you eaten, is to just say, how's it? Mm. And I definitely just say, ketchup. And uh, I definitely, like, the first many times that was said to me was just like, how's what (laughs) what am i what am i meant to be replying about i don't even know what i'm meant to be talking about let alone how it is so uh i i feel for your many levels there yeah and i think how do you do is a really good example of one that's gotten older and become more deprecated like i wouldn't expect anyone to say that now i had one teacher in school that would say how art whenever he would see us in the hallway it was just like the thing that he said Mm. That is the person who still practices medieval court dances while we're all doing the Macarena. <laughs> this is like, yeah, you're, you're you're doing a different dance, but it was still very clear in context, right? Like, <laughs> that is an adorable affectation. <laughs> Sometimes I say "how goes" and like I don't know where I got it, but like people seem to understand it. Hmm. And like maybe it's kind of is a semi literal translation from French because in French "ça va" is like it goes it or like it goes, but yeah. I think another part of the child language acquisition bit that happens at an older age is also acquiring things like phone scripts. You know, like, what do you say when you're on the phone? Because it's not quite the same as when you're greeting someone in person. Oh my gosh, I used to hate the phone. And my mom used to, I like, I remember being overtly coached by my mom in what I should say. And she was like, and then the person will say, Hi, this is Blah. Is your mum there? Mm. And I just used to be like, oh, okay, are you sure they're going to say that? <laughs> like, what? Like, I just hadn't got the dance moves down pat and it felt like a lot more effort. And my mum was like, I already know exactly how this phone call is going to go. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I find like as a kid, I really hated trying to pick up the phone too, even like as a, you know, young teenager type, like really hated picking up the phone, especially once I sounded old enough that people thought I might be my mum. <laughs> But I right. still clearly wasn't. And now as an adult, I find myself using the scripts that I overheard my parents use. Like, so if I need to spell my surname over the phone, I spell it the same way my mom spelled it in like the same groups, M-C-C-U-L-L-O-C-H. Yeah. So you have those, you kind of pick up those ritualized bits of conversations. And it's easier for me to do it as an adult because I'm able to just directly access the adult rituals rather than try to do this sort of weird child mediated ritual of like, is your mom there? But I never heard my parents do that half of the conversation. You'll be shocked to know that once I got the phone script down pat, I used to enjoy messing with it. Um, (laughs) Of course you did. Of course you did. uh, Which used to happen a lot because, as I've probably talked about in the naming episodes, uh, both of my parents are called Chris. (laughs) And so people would be like, hi, has Chris gone there? And the only acceptable moves usually are, yes, I'll get him for you. Or, no, he's not in at the moment. Can I take a message? Mm-hmm. And no one expects the, which one? <laughs> because especially if they only know one of your parents, I guess, then they think they know unambiguously who they're asking for. Very satisfying. <laughs> Once you get comfortable with the script, the power that it, it allows you to have is is very satisfying. One of the things that I was fascinated to find when I was diving into the research on this for Because Internet is that when the phone was introduced as a piece of technology, this didn't just stress like you and I and probably a lot of people out as kids. This stressed out like the whole society. That is actually really reassuring. Right. And so people were really unsure about what you should say when you pick up a phone, because like, how do you say good morning if you don't know if it's morning where they are or like, you know, I don't know. And there were a couple options that were proposed for things that one could say on answering the phone. Was one of them hello? One of them was hello. Okay, good. One of them was ahoy hoy. Oh, Gretchen, we have squandered. We have squandered an opportunity that was presented to us as a society. (laughs) The thing is, is that like now hello is this general purpose greeting, but it wasn't at the time. It was a thing you said like hello for like to summon dogs and stuff. Oh, yeah, it, hello was not a greeting at the time. Right. It's not like they were just like, well, we'll take this thing we use face to face and use it on the telephone. No, no, no. This was like, we're going to invent this new greeting. Oh. 
And for a while, it was like this telephone thing that one said, and people who said hello face to face were like a little bit gauche. Right. It's kind of like some people get worried now if people say like LOL or OMG or something face to face, and you're like, I don't know, that's an internet thing. Like, can you actually say that out loud? <laughs> <laughs> and then it was like, but you're you're saying hello and you're not on the telephone. <laughs> like, ahoy, ahoy. Ahoy, ahoy. Another suggestion, which like I'm pretty glad this one didn't catch on, was what is wanted? Oh, that sounds very. <laughs> That is a very aggressive first move. Right. It's very abrupt. And one of the suggestions for what you said when you finished your phone conversation was just, that is all. And and just hang up. Just hang up. I mean, I think it would have been better for everyone to stop us from the endless goodbye loops if we had just, as a society, accepted that that was the <laughs> phatic conclusion. Well, I think there's actually something really useful about those goodbye loops, though, because when you say goodbye to someone in person, you get to kind of watch them pull away from you if necessary, you know, very Mr. Darcy-esque, like, oh, no, I'm going to watch them pull away from me. You have this sort of gradual leaving. Mm -hmm. um, whereas when you hang up the phone or when you hang up a video call, for that matter, the rupture is very final. Like, you hang up and then it's over. And so you mm -hmm. kind of need more steps to have happen so that you don't just feel like, well, that that's over and that's done. You need a kind of a longer turn-taking uh, or leave-taking process. I think about the same thing, you know, doing video calls where you have a whole group of video calls, people, everyone's waving at each other as you're leaving. And that's kind of the signal when everyone's doing the wave in the video that now you can click on the X and you won't be missing anything because you've all synced up on the waves, which is a lot easier to do in the video space than it is in audio only. For sure. The anxiety about phone greetings reminds me a lot of kind of almost annual put it in your calendar discussion about anxieties over how to start and end emails. <laughs> As a society, we still haven't collectively agreed on a hello equivalent. Yeah, like there's, there's several and it kind of depends on which sort of subculture you're in. And it's, it's interesting because like, in text messages, the norm is very much in the other direction. Like you often don't begin a text message or like a chat or something with like, hey, how are you? And I think people, people often view if you just send someone like an instant, instant message or a chat message or something that's like, hey, how's it going? Without any indication of what you want from them, it's sort of weird. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Like, if you're going to start a conversation with someone in chat, you have the responsibility to introduce a topic, because that way they know what they're getting into when they spend that first reply. And they can judge if they have time to, to respond. It's more like, hey, just had a, this question about this thing, or like, I just saw this link, I thought you might like it. And then the person knows when they start replying, like, what kind of conversation they're trying to enter, enter into. But in email, it's the inverse. And so you get this sort of people making fun of, like, you know, grandparents texting of, like, you know, hi, so-and-so, how's it going at this, here's this thing, love grandma and grandpa in the text message. Whereas in email, the inverse is the case, where you do want to have these greetings, and people who don't send the greetings, sometimes they're the ones that occasion angst, or which greetings you pick occasions a lot of angst. I think we should go back to your obedient servant. <laughs> Uh, one of the examples that I actually had in Because Internet of these elaborate phatic expressions in letters was to the right noble and valorous Sir Walter Raleigh from this letter from Edmund Spencer. And I cited this as an example of like, nobody does this anymore. And then there was a class who was reading the book. <laughs> Uh, as part of their internet linguistics, you know, digital media communications class. And one of the students sent their professor an email with to the right noble and valorous professor so-and-so Excellent. Uh, because of the book. And I was just so pleased about this. They told me about it. I, I was just so delighted. Um, so maybe we should go back to this. It's also one of these cases where, you know, as long as someone isn't actually sending you a nasty email where they call you nasty names, which is definitely like they're definitely trying to be very rude if they're doing that. But if the case is like, is this person using a comma or not? Like, is this person using hi or hey or dear or something? Like, everyone here is trying to be polite. Like, those are all things that people are trying to be polite. And, you know, or is somebody signing off like, I hope you're well, or, you know, hope you're bearing up, <laughs> like, hope you're doing as well as possible under the circumstances. Like, there are all these different variants that one can use. And, you know, they're all trying to be polite. And so I think that thinking of them as part of a unified class of phatic expressions can help us relax a little bit about trying to read too much into you know, the messages that we're sending are getting really worried about the messages that we're sending other people because it's a reflection that ultimately everyone's trying. I really like thinking about fatics as this more abstract attempt at a cultural dance because it makes me far more relaxed about when these friction points happen and people maybe don't use the forms you expect 
And it allows me to kind of reflect on my own choices and how I am maybe doing social politeness. It also just makes me really satisfied when you and someone else get all the dance moves right in a little interaction in a shop and you can kind of think about it more in terms of the the social interaction it's achieving rather than the specific steps that you're taking. Yeah, and I think this is one of the things that attracts a lot of people to linguistics is – you know, having this stuff of like, oh, here's this thing I took a ranted that I haven't thought about, and here's actually what's going on, or here's this sort of overt description of what I'm doing, and this can make it easier to do the dance and not worry that, oh, maybe it's inauthentic, because like the authenticity is doing the dance and we're we're participating in a particular dance and you're you're seeing someone who's doing this sort of dance and it's still space to have the deep heart to heart conversations, but not all the conversations that we have need to be that heart to heart. And there's a space for both kinds of interactions. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves, IPA ties, schwa badges, and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter. My blog is allthingslinguistic.com. My book about internet language, now available in paperback, is called Because Internet. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo, and you'll see me make a small cameo in Chapter 5 of Because Internet. Have you listened to all the Lingthusiasm episodes and wish there were more? You can get access to 41 bonus episodes right now to listen to at patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Patrons also get access to our Discord chat room to talk to other linguistics fans and other awards, as well as helping keep the show ad-free. Recent bonus topics include music, linguistics for kids, and linguistics and numbers. If you can't afford to pledge, that's okay too. We really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their lives. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our senior producer is Claire Gaughan, our editorial producer is Sarah Dothirala, and our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!